It is my pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker. Now, this is a man of, of huge accomplishments who really needs no introduction to this audience. Moshe Safdie is an architect, urban planner, educator, theorist, and author who embraces a comprehensive and humane design philosophy. He is committed to architecture that supports and enhances a project's program that is informed by the geographic, social, and cultural elements that define a place and that responds to human needs and aspirations. Several comprehensive monographs of Mr. Safdie's work have been published, and by coincidence, you can purchase signed copies of some of these in the museum's shop immediately following tonight's lecture. Mr. Safdie, we are honored and delighted to welcome you back to the museum, and we look forward to your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Moshe Safdie. Good evening. It's uh, nice to be back at the Building Museum. I'm happy that the sound system has been improved. <laughs> I wanted tonight to talk about uh, symbols in the public realm, obviously architectural symbols. Um, but I do so with a bit of a heavy heart. On one hand, several of my recent projects have had to deal um, face-to-face -face with the issue of symbolic interpretation. Uh, but it all happens at a time where there's a fair amount of promiscuous in our promiscuity in our profession. And when uh, you talk about symbols in architecture, it immediately connotes the very popular term now, iconic architecture. I mean, a building isn't successful unless it's iconic and uh, signature architecture, and that leads us to the new term, uh, maybe not so new anymore, star, star architects, and so on and so forth. And uh, it seems to me that the emphasis is on the expressive um, and the personal, and it resonates with Phillips Johnson's seminal statement there are no rights or wrong in any of the arts or architecture, only the world of wonderful freedom. And yet, this is in the context of what has been much of my own professional career of dealing with the urban, dealing with density and mega scale and the changing form of cities, and the pressure on resources, and the uh, hunger for infrastructure, and the crisis in achieving urban mobility, all of which are sort of central issues for our profession today. And so in some ways you say, well, how, how dare you speak about symbolism in architecture? Um, much of what concerns us when we think in urbanism has to do with housing and the workspace and urban meeting places and whether they work or not, and they attempt to find contemporary responses to what was once the Agora and the Cardo Maximus and the Bazaar or the Souk or the Street or the Piazza. And much of my own endeavor has been to try and address these things in, in many, many different contexts. So, it is themes like, for everyone, a garden, how to humanize mega scale, um, that I think the main thrust of my professional activity has been. And yet, at the same time, the question of symbolism doesn't go away. And it increasingly seems to be to have a weighty, uh, become a weighty component of the design of the public realm. And so, uh, if I'm to introduce the subject, I would say, let's first remember that it's in the context of the city that we speak about. Uh, the opera image I took in Shanghai in 1973, there were no high-rise buildings in Shanghai, uh, only the old Bund. There were hardly any cars. Uh, Bicycles prevailed, 
this is Shanghai today. And within our own lifetime, at least my lifetime, uh, this extraordinary trans transformation in scale. Uh, Sao Paulo, the urban fabric that had been, and the new fabric of high-rise towers eating away in a, what a, appears to be a random and structureless way. And Seoul, Korea, and Hong Kong, and so on and so forth. Uh, in our office, a uh, couple of years ago, in, as part of a research fellowship, we decided to do a study of rethinking habitat. Forty years later, how would we do it differently today? These were some of the study models. There were dozens of them. And what emerged was several questions and different answers. One was, could you do habitat cheaper? Could you build it more economically? The criteria was, let's do it completely out of vertical load-bearing structures, maybe that, uh, much more compact than we did with the original building. Could you reach economies that would make it more affordable? And so on. The other question was, could we achieve the densities today? Could you achieve the densities of Hong Kong and Midtown Manhattan uh, and Shanghai? And this series of proposals involve mixed use, showing that mixing offices and apartments and other urban functions works to advantage, and trying to achieve the level of amenities that we had striven for at Habitat at densities 10 times greater. And so on and so forth, exploring these uh, possibilities on a theoretical basis without a client, without any real sight. But, as I'm happy to say at this point, uh, in this project that recently began construction in Singapore, we're building projects that learn from these studies. Uh, they are middle-income housing. They are extraordinarily high densities. Uh, and uh, they're happening out there with private developers, without subsidies. And so there is an amazing turn of events that Strangely enough, mostly in Asia, in mega cities that are hard to imagine in terms of scale, things are happening. But I want to go back to the evolution of my own thinking in terms of public institutions and symbolism. Diana mentioned the National Gallery of Canada. It was the first public building, museum, that I designed in the mid-80s. You see the site at the corner here. Across the river, across the Ottawa River in Hull, Quebec, again, symbolism, another museum, civilization, all in the site of Parliament. So the government was building two museums in the French-speaking and English-speaking parts of the country, with a hope, who knows what. And as Prime Minister Trudeau, who initiated the project at the time, proudly said, Ottawa was the only, citizen, uh, only city in which the arts, governance, uh, and religion were equal in the skyline. Well, that put a lot of heat on what the building was all about, because I recognize that a national gallery museum is not just any museum that it's part of the ritual of public life. Uh, the Great Hall, which you see here, juxtaposed against the Library of Parliament, uh, sits uh, overlooking the Ottawa River. Uh, the, the building is as public as can be. But what was fascinating was the debate that evolved when we designed the building um, about different alternative schemes, which we call the introvert and extrovert schemes. Uh, and I show here the Schinkel uh, Berlin Museum uh, of the turn of the, uh, turn of the 20th century, uh, a typical 19th century museum, introvert, its public spaces in its center, surrounded by galleries, opaque to the outside, and the axonometric of the National Gallery, in which all the public spaces, the Great Hall, the ceremonial spaces, wrap the building and are open to the city, transparent to the city, 
The great ramp that leads to the great hall is a ceremonial route upwards into the great hall itself, in which, as things have evolved, now take place all the uh, heads of state dinners and other formal events of government, as well as, of course, all the events relating to the gallery itself. And this great urban room, open to the city, uh, transforms seasonally as the sun, hot sun, is screened at summer and as it opens up to the uh, sky and sun at winter. With its oasis garden in its center, and of course, you do get to an art gallery sooner or later. <coughs> this notion of an extrovert public building was to stick with me as we came to design the Vancouver Public Library, the Saltic Library, and many, many other projects after. What does it mean to have a building that opens up to the city, whose life is visible to the city, that in, in a sense it be, becomes an extension or living room of the public realm of the city? But I want to move on to the subject of more overt symbolism, which I had to deal with first when I came to design the various projects at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. Because as you deal with weighty subjects which demand a response to, the, to, to emotional questions, uh, and you think about it in terms of the visual arts, uh, and I put up Guernica because this was one of the powerful paintings of the 20th century that had to do with a moment in history that had to do with a sense of protest, which had to do with war and peace. Uh, the, vi the, the, the means of the artist are fundamentally visual. Uh, Rodin's uh, Calais uh, Memorial, again, the, the, the extraordinary expressiveness of the weighty subjects at hand. But architecture, uh, I think is fundamentally different. And here I think it's important to emphasize that the symbolic in architecture cannot occur on purely visual grounds. It cannot be a visually expressive statement. It's got to grow out of uh, the language of architecture, which first of all is material, it's tectonic, uh, it has to do with the materiality of architecture. It has to do with the broader purpose of a building, the life intended in it. It's got to do with the fact that it's rooted in place and how it responds to that place, how it belongs to it, is fundamental to its conception. Uh, so in that context, the symbolic can only occur as a kind of a, as it evolves and grows out of these set of complex considerations. In 1976, I was asked to design a memorial to the children who perished in the Holocaust. And uh, it was to be a museum with objects. I spent many months in the archives of Yad Vashem. You would visit that children's museum when you came out of the historic museum. I thought at the time that people would be totally saturated as he emerged from the story of the Holocaust itself. And after many months of working on it, I came back and I said, I think it should not be a museum. It should be a place of contemplation. And I proposed that under a hill with a natural cave on the grounds of Yad Vashem, we would cut into the ground, uh, bring the public in there. There's an antechamber with photographs of some of the children from, who died from the archive. And then you enter a large space in which there is a single memorial candle in the center. And by an arrangement of visual optical glass walls, it reflects into infinity millions of candles. And you walk through this space as you walk through the candles and you hear a voice reading names, ages, and birthplaces which goes on for three months without repeating itself, and then you emerge to light and to life. It's interesting that in 1976, the management of Yad Vashem, uh, the board, rejected the design. It said it's too abstract, people will misunderstand, they'll think it's a discotheque, 
And I should emphasize it was before Maya Lin's memorial. It was before the notion of abstraction as a place of memory uh, was on the scene. Uh, and it sat in the, in the box, in the model, in the office of the director for a decade. It was in the mid-80s that a man who lost his son in Auschwitz came in and saw the model and wrote a check and it got built. Uh, immediately to become the place where people most intensely reacted to at Yad Vashem. And that led to another project that turned out to be symbolically charged. Symbolically charged, which was the National Museum of the Sikhs, which we will be opening actually in November of this year. Uh, one day on my uh, monthly visits uh, to Jerusalem, I had a call from the foreign ministry saying we have a guest, the chief minister of the state of Punjab. He was brought on an official visit to Yad Vashem. And at the children's memorial, he broke down. And he asked to meet the architect. And I was summoned to the hotel. He was surrounded by uh, fierce-looking bodyguards. Uh, and he smiled and he said, we have suffered a great deal, the Sikh people, and we are building a museum to tell the story of our people, and I want you to come and design it. And a week, two weeks later, I was in India. They first took me to the Golden Temple in Amritsar, uh, explaining that this was the religious center of the Sikhs. The museum will be the secular center of the Sikhs, and the Sikhs are both a religion and a people. And we went to this small town outside Chandigarh, the capital of the Punjab, where there are a number of holy structures. This is a pilgrimage place. And this site, which you see here, uh, walking distance from the sacred places, uh, I chose actually as the place to build a museum on either sides of the valley coming through the edge of the town. And so these were my first sketches on the first trip back home. I was recalling my visit to Jaisalmer in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in Rajasthan, thinking of the fortress tradition of the Sikhs where the last guru, Govind, had built his fortresses in this town and how the building might grow out of the sand cliffs and, of course, how we might respond to a complex program. This was the model that I brought back, and uh, lots of fierce discussion. What's a foreigner know about Sikhism, and why have we picked, uh, imported an architect? Uh, I went away for two more months to develop the drawings. When I came back uh, a couple of months later, the, the pedestrian bridge that uh, links the two parts of the valley was built. Uh, and shortly thereafter, we had a massive groundbreaking, and half a million people showed up. And, and I say that because I want to emphasize what place this building has for the Sikh people. In other words, the design, the scheme, the institution that's being created needs to speak to a people. They need to identify with it. This was, again, at the groundbreaking. Uh, and we proceeded to embark on the project construction. Ten years later, now the exhibits have been installed. They tell the story of the religion and the people. The valley uh, has become a valley of war and gardens, which we use with the runoff water. Uh, one side is the historic museum. Across the pedestrian bridge are the auditorium, library, changing exhibitions, which also link to the town, the restaurants by the water on the edge here, uh, concrete structure, local stones, built completely with local labor, uh, which rose to the occasion, and a building that in its own way is trying to reinterpret in a contemporary way, <coughs> but yet in a way in which those who will use and experience the building, the Sikh themselves, feel a sense of belonging to. I guess the ultimate test is taking a 
Sikh, uh, a cab in New York with a Sikh driver, and inevitably they know about the project. I've even had a couple of free rides as a result. <laughs> the museum itself is a sequence of galleries organized in a linear way, and the exhibits themselves are being uh, created in all of India by recreating crafts, weaving, carving, um, many, many crafts, some of which have been revived to tell that story rather than the usual high-tech, uh, although there'll also be the usual high-tech in some of the spaces. And seen from the mountains as you come upon the building from the north, the sense of fortress rising out of the, out of the hills and seen from the temple and the town itself. So I go back to Yad Vashem, uh, which, well after the visit of the chief minister, had decided to completely rebuild the historic museum. And there were many reasons for that. Uh, this is the site of Yad Vashem before we began. The historic museum behind the trees here with the Hall of Memory. Uh, this is the whole mount of mem mem the memorial mountain, which also accommodates the National Cemetery. And the decision to rebuild Yad Vashem had to do, first of all, with the fact that the original built in the 50s had gone from 300,000 people, visitors a year, to 300, 3 million, because the information itself in the museum had become very limited and obsolete as compared with the Holocaust Museum in Washington, which was by far the most comprehensive in the world at that moment, and so a complete new installation uh, which, on which we worked hand in hand with the curators and the exhibit designers. Uh, and uh, unlike the Sikhs that gave a project on a silver platter and say, come and design our museum, Yad Vashem had a three-phase competition. First phase, second phase, third phase, they couldn't make up their mind, but eventually we got it. And uh, my first, I, I should actually talk about all the things I thought about not doing when I, got, when I started working on it during the competition. I did not want a big building on the top of the mountain. I thought the mountain should stay virgin as it was. I did not want a building that felt like a building. I thought it should feel like an archaeological excavation or a quarry or something which is of nature that you just moved into it rather than a building that has craftsmanship and and details and makes you conscious about its presence. And so I started sketching about buildings that cut through the mountain, that came in one side and came out of the other side, and that basically the museum would be all below the mountain. And in fact, that's what eventually we built, uh, a kind of a concrete prism that cuts through the mountain from one end and bursts out on the other. There is a reception entry building, sorry, there's a reception entry building uh, through which the public comes, crosses a bridge to enter the museum, and then moving through underground, through galleries, see the skylights over the galleries, moving right through until they come out to the north, then emerging back through the Hall of Names, which remained, crossing the crest, back to the Children's Memorial, and out. The reception building was a kind of a building that is a transition from the day-to-day -day life to a sacred place. Um, the light coming through is filtered through a series of trellises. Again, coming to the symbolic, the questions I was asked after it opened was, did I do this so everyone would be striped as the prisoners in the camps were. And I declare that was not my thought or intention, but it is what the guides now tell people when they take them through. The bridge is a kind of a transition. It takes you away from the daily experiences, and then you enter this structure, uh, and you start moving as the floor descends at a 5% slope into the depth of the earth. You are aware of this. You are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, 
but these cuts in the floor, these canals or channels in the floor, prevent you from actually moving directly. You've got to move in a zigzag formation from room to room, chapter by chapter, forced to see the story in its narrative. Uh, working with the exhibit designers, these cuts in the floor became major pauses. These are the books representing the books that were burnt in the great book burning in Berlin. And then you move on from gallery to gallery. There is no material other than concrete. I had to get dispensation not to use stone that is required in Jerusalem by law. The entire building is concrete. The floor is concrete. Uh, there's just glass skylights and concrete. And the exhibits and the building completely merge. And actually what amazes me is not only do the exhibit and the building merge, but it's the public experiencing the exhibit that merge into the exhibits that merge into the architecture. As you see here. And then you reach the Hall of Names, which was conceived as a place with the three million names, the files of the testimonial pages uh, are stored in, this, in the perimeter. Some photographs of faces from them are exhibited in the cone. And I excavated into the bedrock an equivalent cut so that looking up, you see the testimonies and faces from the, for the three million, of the three million names that are known and as you look into the earth, you see the rock and the water, ground water below and the reflections of the cone above as a memorial to the names that we shall never know. And the last word was the architect's word and perhaps the most controversial of all. Emerging from the Hall of Names, I propose that the public come to the precipice, to the edge of this prism overlooking the mountains of Jerusalem. And the structure itself burst out, as you can see here, cantilevering over the mountain. It was very controversial because the committee felt that it was an optimistic statement, that it was unduly optimistic and inappropriately expressive architecturally. But the discussion that went on for months, uh, the concept prevailed and was realized. And it is again this moment where people come to this edge and they look at the forest of Jerusalem and the fact that there is a city evolving out there, uh, growing out there, and life did prevail, uh, that becomes the memorable moment for many people's visit. I'm going to make an about turn uh, uh, from a heavy subject to what big, could have been conceived as a light-hearted subject, um, an integrated resort, as they call it, in Singapore, a 10 million square foot complex of mixed use to encourage tourism in Singapore, which also included in its program set by the government of Singapore an iconic, I'm quoting out of the report, an iconic cultural building that will become the sy symbol for Singapore as the Sydney Opera House became the symbol for Australia. This is a straight quote out of the report. I know Frank Gehry told me at some point that when he was asked to do Bilbao, the same sentence occurred, like the Sydney Opera House was for Australia. But I want to start with what to me was the ultimate challenge here because I put the question of the symbol of Singapore on the back burner in my own thinking. Um, and, you know, there was a program of 3,000 hotel rooms and a convention center and shopping and a whole urban meeting place and a, 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 an empty site that was man-made, land-filled, creating a bay, very intimate bay, which I was told was fashioned in scale on the inner harbor of Baltimore, uh, and actually uh, converted it into a, a freshwater reservoir uh, uh, for, for Singapore. 
you see the site and the building across the water. And it was conceived by the planning uh, agency of Singapore, the URA, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, which is an extremely proactive organization as part of a continuous uh, network or continuous promenade, water edge promenade, all of which is active, all of which is public, and which forms a ring around the whole downtown as we form the, the last part of the loop. The project already realized here. So you see here the promenade that forms this continuous public place. The program called for a lot of public, uh, public infrastructure facilities, and I immediately realized I can't think of this as a building. I need to think about it as a, as a town, as a city. And I was thinking back to the famous plan of Jerusalem, the Madaba plan that shows Roman Jerusalem, Byzantine Jerusalem, with its central Cardo Maximus, the central thoroughfare, uh, the Decaminus, uh, the city gates, and somehow the clear structure of Roman and Greek cities that always had the main drag, the sort of spine of urban life. And I decided to integrate the spine that we were creating here, integrated with the promenade on the waterfront. So this became an indoor, outdoor public place with the cross streets, or as they call them, view corridors, forming the framework of the city. And everything else plugs into it. So theaters, convention, casino, museum, hotels, are all plug-in elements into that frame. And that spine, which is multi-level, which takes in the outdoors, which is partially air-conditioned and partially, partially open, and you can flow indoor and outdoor, becomes this urban, urban uh, center of activity. And the program also called for a piazza of 20,000 people for, all na for national events which here we propose would be hydraulic and could change levels and could be an amphitheater, flat or stepped, depending on the events that took place in it. In short, we were really able to come forward with all kinds of ideas about creating infrastructure at the public realm level. This is the uh, structure that creates this enclosure, which is filled with light and shaded. Uh, the notion that these are a series of gardens, the gardens stepping from the water all the way to the roof of the hotels, each of these being a public place, public garden, open and available to the public. So that you've got the promenade and you've got an upper park and garden and then you've got the sky park on the 60th floor. So the Sky Park itself, which I certainly never thought about in terms of the symbolic message of the project, clearly became something of a sensation for the city. Uh, the notion of two and a half acres uh, on the 59th floor that looked to the whole region around with uh, a public observatory, an unbelievable infinity pool, uh, I'm not working for the tourist board, but sometimes it works. <laughs> but, you know, I'll cut short uh, talking about the project because I want to come back to the question of what the, the uh, terms of reference of the project required. They wanted a symbol for Singapore, and they wanted it to be on that promontory site that stuck into the bay. And I started thinking about what would that institution be? Uh, surely it couldn't be symbolic if it didn't have some meaning. And what would it be? Concert hall they have, theaters they have, aquariums they had, and science center they have. And so I propose we invent something new that maybe has something to do with the spirit of the day, a museum of art science expressed as one word. 
a place to explore the unity of the arts and the sciences, the unity of the creative process that is behind the arts and the sciences. And that somehow stuck, and around that, a building began to evolve. And the building reaches up, it floats on its site. Uh, I felt it should be kind of detached from the ground. Uh, there are a series of galleries in the spaces above and below. And after the initial sketches, I started seeking a rational geometry uh, which would make it both buildable, but also that would give it a sense of order and organization. And first I looked at spheres, and eventually we embraced the geometry of spheroids, kind of compressed spheres, and generated something which is completely mathematical, a series of, uh, of volumes and spaces generated by uh, the spheroids with slightly varying radii, leading to a building which had galleries below and galleries above, reaching to the light and creating quite unusual and new kinds of galleries with a great deal of inventiveness uh, that went into installing exhibits into them. The whole building as a whole is like a great collector of rainwater. The rain drains through the center, coming through the oculus, and falls down the full height of the building and is collected and uh, used in the uh, irrigation of, of the project. And then the galleries themselves, which you see here, reaching upwards to the light, the workmen giving the finishing touches to the skylights as they rise up, and the kind of installations that have now evolved over the past year, uh, really designers rising to the occasion of how these spaces have been used, as well as the regular exhibits below. But what is fascinating for me at this point is that the project has become the kind of symbol of Singapore. I don't know if the project is symbolic, but certainly Singaporeans think about it as kind of uh, the physical manifestation of the city. And certainly people in Asia are now identifying Singapore with it. And so it does reflect on the power of architecture to create identity, to create place, uh, to achieve things which we sometimes uh, think are almost beyond the scope of architecture. I want to conclude with three projects, all of which are opening. One, the Kaufman Center opened last two weeks ago, uh, and the other two all opened this year. It wasn't planned that way, but it, it happened. And in each case, the USIP being the, an obvious case, but in the case of these, the other two projects, the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts and the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, the projects proved to have extraordinary significance to their locale. I don't think anybody set out to say we're building a significantly symbolic project for the, for the city. Uh, the Kaufman Foundation and Julia Kaufman set out to create a wonderful performing art center uh, for Kansas City. Um, but the site they picked was very pivotal. It's the site that connects uh, downtown on one side and the Crown Center to the south, uh, next to the Convention Center. It is pivotal in the sense that it's visible from the entire southern half of the city, which forms a kind of an escarpment. Um, two performing halls were to be built, the concert hall and an opera, ballet, proscenium theater. Um, I remember just going there first and thinking, what an extraordinary sight. I've got to turn the building to the south. That's where there sort of seems to look into, uh, actually, it's Kansas, Missouri, but it's looking out to the state of Kansas. And I was thinking in terms of the theaters uh, almost being like two instruments and contained by a tent of glass, uh, which would be the public space, all transparent and open to the city to the south. Uh, again, I'll cut through many years of evolution. This, these projects all seem to take 10 years. Doesn't matter where you start and where you end, they take 10 years. Uh, 
the two theater, the two halls here contained by the glass uh, tent looking towards the south with the driveway uh, in front. But it set up a dilemma because performing art theaters always have the, the, the stage tower. And the stage tower always looks like the back of the building. Um, and it's a dilemma because it's a massive element. And I started looking into how I might make each and every aspect of the theater building uh, uh, resonate and, 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 and invite. And so this kind of led to a somewhat uh, schizophrenic building with its transparency to the south, where you can see into the public spaces at all times, and uh, the driveway leading you in with the drop-offs and uh, massive garage under the what now is a park, uh, which was completely landscaped south of the building, and at the same time maintaining uh, an entrance from, the, from downtown coming through and creating a very playful structure that contains the stage tower and uh, the concert hall organ as seen from the north. And actually it turns out that what was to be the back of the building is now what gets on all the postcards. Uh, but it has this dramatic canyon in the center where you can enter from downtown on the axis of Central Street, which leads you right into the lobby, the main hall, and play very playful with the light and very much kind of cutting this horizon line that's so much part of the prairie experience. And then in cross-section, the concert hall, which was on which I worked with Yasu Toyota as acoustician, and you can see in the section how the tent uh, glass structure extends with its mast and cables to support the lobby, and the concert hall itself with its wood uh, envelope. Uh, one of my objectives was no one sits under a canopy, everybody's in the main space, no underside of balconies, and the organ. Daylight coming down from above, this is daylight, and the proscenium theater, uh, 1800 seats, the structure, and the public lobbies with both theaters opening up into it so that when they've got a black tie opera event in one and a rock concert in the others, the public will mix the, certainly the refreshment places are common to both. And the whole idea is that this is going to be a great urban room used various hours of the day and, and night as it is becoming even since we opened. And again, the, the, the fascinating thing is how a place is then received by the public. Um, there were two formal days of events, black ties and all, and then there was open house. It was a very rainy day, and 56,000 people showed up, all with their umbrellas, and they were surrounding the buildings in three circles around, and moving slowly and coming in the building and taking ownership. And that was, that was really very exciting. Crystal Bridges, which opens November 11, is another 10-year affair, um, not far from Kansas. It's, the, uh, it's, the it'll, it'll, it's Crystal Bridges, the Museum of American Art. And it's walking distance from downtown Bentonville here. And please don't be misled by the term downtown Bentonville. But it's a small town center with a square and the little store in which the story of Walmart began, Sam Walton's first little store. Uh, you can walk, you will be, after November 11, able to walk down a trail down this path, visit a little pavilion here, and then move down. And in the valley, which is a family estate, that's where the 
Faye Jones residence of the Walton family is uh, located. In that valley where there is a spring, I have proposed to dam uh, the valley and create a series of ponds around which the museum would be built, or is built. And so there is this stream coming through, all the mature trees being on the hilltops. So by building within the valley itself low, we're actually preserving uh, a lot of wonderful uh, forestry. And here was a sketch in which one dam and a second dam would create two ponds about 12 feet apart. And that will create kind of a sense of place around which a series of buildings are constructed. Two buildings form bridges across the water, and they are literally bridges, as you will see. Galleries come around and form a loop, an auditorium, great hall, a curatorial wing with a library and changing exhibition, and lots of social spaces. Alice Walton conceived this as a museum, community center, a place for social interaction. She had actually visited my Skirball Museum in LA where she felt this was not quite a museum and wanted something like it. The entire structure is built of wood, laminated, beams made of Arkansas pine, concrete and wood, and glass, of course. And you see here the uh, bridge structure suspended across from buttress to buttress, the floor forming the dam, the galleries with, its, with their own individual skylight control systems, which are really within that structure, forming a building within a building as you move about. And this allows you, A, to take in the surrounding, uh, forest and ponds and nature, and at the same time to be able to experience art in conditions that preserve the, that preserve the conservation requirements in terms of the art itself, but allow you for many openings to the surrounding area, and you're moving in and out as you go from galleries indoor to outdoor uh, with natural light, controlled natural light, uh, it is about nature, it is about experiencing the art together, and I think for Alice Walton, it's about telling the story of America through the collection. Because the buildings have skylights, they radiate light at night as well, and that becomes part of the experience. And you do reach the project from above, and you see it from above as you descend down into the valley. These were some of the mock-ups of the structural system as we evolved it and the project uh, a few months ago. You see the copper roofs uh, over the wood structure, uh, hovering over the galleries. All this in the foreground would be water. And again, nearing completion. And so I will conclude with USIP in home territory. And you all know the site, I would think, and probably many of you have been there. But I want to start really with my own experience with this building, which was a, a, a request for proposal, that, which we received 11 years ago, to submit our credentials for USIP. And I said, USI who? I had no idea what the United States of Institute of Peace was. And I have to say that in past years, as we were working on the scheme, and I would uh, give a lecture and I'd say, who's heard of USIP? Uh, audience of 500, two hands go up. So while Congress created that institute to seek peace and conflict resolution 22 years ago, it didn't become a household word. And it was clear to me when I saw the call of proposal and I saw the site that, that by definition, the selection of that site made this a symbolically charged building. Had USIP gone into M Street or K Street or DuPont Circle, it would have been maybe an elegant office building.
But by being on the National Mall facing Lincoln Memorial and the Vietnam Memorials, it becomes a statement about peace on the National Mall. And that put a lot of heat on us. This was a competition, I should add. One more of those faced competitions. Um, and to me, it had to do several things. It had to be a really terrific workspace. This is a working institution. They have research. They have conferences. It would have to reach out to the public because it was a museum program to attract the public to show what they were doing. But it would have to be more than that. And I started doodling in terms of recognizing that along the mall there were those, all these biaxial, symmetrical, bazaar like buildings, and they created a kind of a rhythm. But this turned the corner on the mall. This was the point where the mall turned around and looked over to Arlington. And em eventually a plan emerged in which the one large public space looked to the Lincoln Memorial, another one more private, this being very public, another one more private looked to Arlington and the P Potomac, and these wings of offices and conference rooms and so on formed a bi bi biaxial symmetry towards the mall itself. So you had a symmetry within asymmetry. And the two wing structure would be masonry and very massive as a very light roof hovered over. And the most I can say about how do you create a symbol for peace, if you can be pretentious enough to try, would be that I thought of lightness, a lightness of being. I kept thinking of Kundera's uh, words, a lightness of being. I thought of whiteness, because this is really a white city in many ways, a white city within a lush greenery. I thought of light, just daylight, permeating everything, and I thought it should be a very serene and calm building. And off we went to think in terms of many, many roof forms, roof structures, that might enclose this, thinking in terms of almost hovering elements, like a flock of birds, which eventually evolved into a highly ordered geometry made purely of uh, spheres, all of these are spherical sections, and toroids, so that it's pure mathematics intersecting to form this composition. And that led us to a scheme that's quite buildable, as every one of these ribs is on the great circle route, and in fact the entire structure is eight inches thick as it spans from side to side. But the greatest objective was to create something of, with a sense of lightness, of glow, bringing light into the structure daytime, glowing outwards at nighttime. These are the models, of course. And then the building itself, as 10 years later it emerges, uh, lots of technical development to create this roof and many other issues. Uh, precast concrete structure, envelope to the building to relate to the masonry scale of the surrounding buildings. And that sense of lightness and glow, which at night uh, is quite powerful, we had to control this so that it would not exceed in brightness surrounding monuments. And above all, it's a wonderful workspace as all the individual offices, collective spaces for interaction. It's really a building about interaction as they now, having moved in, uh, uh, recognize uh, has changed the whole culture of the place. When I'm often asked what buildings I look to for inspiration and what really inspires me as an architect. And invariably, I would say lots of buildings and places inspire me. But what I learn the most from as an architect is looking and studying and understanding design and nature. That somehow, as you look at design of nature by natural selection, uh, by evolution over time, you see the causality between form and order 
and purpose. I guess it has to do with fitness. This is the this is a cross section of the wing of the bird I showed before, the individual wing that has to have extraordinary strength with a minimum weight and its amazing lattice of lightness and strength. Um, Nautilus shell is familiar example of, of a form of growth and how growth can take place with a constant proportion in relationship to the body of the animal within it. But even the transformation of plant life seasonally tells us about architectural potential, about buildings that, and public spaces it can transform from being open to the air or heated or conditioned at other times about the kind of transformation that architecture and public, the public realm really ought to be uh, going through uh, as we go from different climates and certainly at different seasons. Uh, or the unbelievably beautiful pattern, but efficient, uh, has to do with the sequence of weaving, the strength, the, uh, all the factors that go into this uh, co-web. And so, it all comes down to the word fitness, which I think is completely relevant uh, to any thinking about architecture. Uh, to quote um, a morphologist about both the terms beauty, which I connect with fitness, and I want to talk about beauty in relationship to fitness. Beauty, this is Theodore Cook, uh, The Curves of Life, written 1917. Beauty connotes, connotes humanity. We call nature a natural object beautiful because we see its form expresses fitness. The perfect fitness is the perfect fulfillment of function in the lines of structure. Kant spoke a great deal about that when he, when he spoke about let the building be what it wants to be. Uh, if, it, if you're designing a school, the Fundamental question at the end is, will it be a wonderful place for learning? Any other preoccupation you might have had, geometry, uh, formal or otherwise, would be secondary to the question, is it a wonderful place for learning? And I don't think there's one answer to this question, but there's, it's a fundamental question just the same. And so, so I believe it brings us back to the question of ethic, the ethic of the profession. And from the kind of declaration that there cannot be an ethic to architecture because in Johnson's word only the world of wonderful freedom I think we need to reaffirm that there is a deep ethic to architecture it is an ethic that we should be exploring it should be central to our discourse it has to do with resources it has to do with how architecture responds to people what it does uh, to their lives which is not only utilitarian but it has to do with the uplifting of the human spirit and creating the kind of magic that give a place identity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There is time for questions, so if you do have a question for Mr. Softy, if you'd kindly raise your hand, we can come around with a microphone so everyone can hear it. <clears throat> my, my question is, how did you deal with the uh, Navy Bureau of Medicine and Surgery on the backside of your building? And, and secondly, if you were going to change any design in Washington, what would you change or, or rearrange? On the first question, uh, Dick Salmon, the president of USIP, tells the story of coming to the Navy to try and purchase the site. And of course, it was a parking lot, as some of you remember. And the Navy actually concern was, replace our parking, we'll make the site available. So we did build 250 parking spaces under the building for the Navy. Since then, 
uh, those buildings, the two buildings, have been turned over or will be turned over to USIP to expand their program. And uh, USIP, I say we, USIP, have 250 pa uh, parking spaces which the Navy isn't using. And so the Navy is wherever they are and USIP is on the site including the parking. On your second question, more difficult, uh, what would I change in Washington? Actually, I want to say something positive about Washington because I've been struggling with some issues in Jerusalem and I keep saying, look at Washington. The decision to keep Washington the height that it is, I think was brilliant. I think that the byproduct of creating buildings that create edges to streets is something that should be cherished and preserved. Um, I think that it's one of the few cities that maintains the scale of street life and a rich street life. And I think that's terrific. Uh, it's funny to cross the river and see that there's another world out there. But I've maintained that Jerusalem is making a mistake in allowing now 30-story towers in the visual basin of the old city. And when they say we have to be a modern city, we can't develop, I say look at Washington. So I'd rather, rather than say all the things I would change in Washington, I'll, I'll stick to the positive. Thank you, Moshe Safdi. It's a great honor to hear you uh, in Washington, but to have known you for as many years as I have known you. I cut my teeth in architecture hearing your lectures about Habitat. And um, I think that what you've done for the building of Habitat in many ways uh, remains still unexplored territory. I think we are entering uh, a time period where residential living and communal uh, living in accessibility and the ability to have independence but also have uh, spaces that bring us together is becoming more and more important. And in many ways, I think those lessons are th uh, very much relevant today. What are you doing to revive that? Um, and, and in many ways, I, I think it's sad that you're not involved in academia as you used to be in my era. Well, I'm not uh, involved in academia, but but a lot of the thrust of these efforts has not stopped because of it. I mean, as I briefly uh, touched, uh, for many years, uh, I mean decades, there was very little going on in our office, so any, any office which, which was opportunity to really start looking at a large scale at housing uh, for, for a developer, be it government or be it a private developer, which was very depressing. And then as we set, set up the research fellowship in our office, in a sense it's my substitute for teaching, we picked revisiting Habitat as a one year's project. And fascinating things came out of it because we realized there's not a singular answer. The answers are multifaceted. It depends on the context, on the city, on the density. But so we produced all these kind of prototypes. But in the past two years, as our almost entire practice has shifted to Asia. We are actually being asked to look at large scale, middle income and upper middle income housing um, of a scale of you know, high density, thousands of units. And while we need to push it in terms of how far a private developer would go in terms of communal spaces, uh, common gardens in the building, individual gardens, the one project that did show is under construction in Singapore. We're looking at projects of thousands of units in, in China. There's something happening in terms of people intrigued with this notion of habitat coming back. It's coming back, in our experience, first in Asia, but that's because things are being built there at that scale. We're here. We can't even get a train between Boston and Washington to run at a reasonable time. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just fascinating. So I think there is an awakening. Uh, I hope it's followed up by te technological changes because when we did our study two years ago, one of the questions was, has anything technologically changed in the last 40 years to change how we build, to make buildings lighter, more prefab prefabricatable, more sustainable? And the shocking answer is, not except for glass technology, which has changed in a dramatic way what we can do with glass and and, and waterproof glass, concrete is concrete, it hasn't really changed, it's still very heavy, it still cracks, 
and steel is steel, we still need to fireproof it, and plastic melts away as soon as you have a fire. So the breakthrough technologically is yet to come. It's not happened. It will happen, but it's not happened. Not quite sure what you meant by buildings that define edges. Say again. Not sure what you mean in regard to Washington architecture, buildings that define edges. Define edges? In what context did I say that? Ah, what I mean in Washington. But I mean, what has happened, I mean, the 19th century street was defined by buildings. An example that would come to me would be the Back Bay area of Boston, in case you know it. You have Commonwealth Boulevard, <coughs> and you've got Newberry Street, and those spaces are defined by buildings which hold the street edge so that they are like walls to a public room. Uh, the street has definition and enclosure because the buildings are conceived as building blocks of the public realm. As soon as you go to Houston or to Denver, that's no longer true. Buildings are pulled away from the property line, and they usually cover a very small part of the site. And whatever it is, they certainly don't remember that there's a street near them. So the public realm falls apart. Then you put parking lots and parking buildings in between, and we have no more city. Please. Well, you're obviously a very global person. I mean, citizens of three countries, you're everywhere building. I wonder if you have any comments about the role of architecture in this age of globalization. I think it's a complex question because it touches to the heart of the issue of the impact of globalization. I think what's happened with globalization, as, we, as I perceive it, is that there is an air of sameness about places. Now, what are these forces? They're, they're multiple forces. Any shopping center, no matter where, mall, looks the same. The stores are the same. The brands are the same. Uh, invariably, the architecture is the same. Um, you go on, you know, the, the typology of buildings, the typical office building, apartment building. You go to Kuwait, you go to Dubai, you go to Shanghai, uh, you go to, uh, you know, Iceland. They're all the same, same materials, same vocabulary. So the, the force of sameness is coming from many, many quarters. Part of it is also the way the emerging countries and developing countries have erased their heritage. I mean, Singapore erased much of its fabric. China, Beijing, which I visited in 73, has hardly anything left of that era. So there's no memory either. And globalization plus the erasure of memory makes for places that have no identity. Now, can we as architects do some, I mean, counter this in some ways in our work? What impact can we have on that is the question. And I think that if we go from place to place and we import our own style, let me call it, our own language, our own personal language, and land it in different places, like you land a brand, you know, there's one of my, you know, there's like the brands of the malls, like you've got your Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton, some cities have 17 Louis Vuittons. So if you do that, you're contributing to that phenomena because you're not contributing. So one of the things I've been intrigued with is how do you draw into the architecture that sense of place, whether it's the Sikhs or whether it's Salem Mass, with the Peabody Museum, or with it, whether it's redeveloping downtown Jerusalem, how do you not only, how do you discover what these ingredients are, and how do you bring them in in an authentic way that doesn't look like pastiche, doesn't look like you're doing a Disney reproduction of Venice. I'm not suggesting we do the Venice of Las Vegas, although my client does, but uh, um, because the, the, it has to be authentic, but I do believe that they are the local cultural ingredients, they have to do with climate, and they have to do with lifestyle, and they have to do with history that you can find and bring into 
the design of place to counter this globalization. I also think that as buildings truly become more responsive to climate and to their setting and to the materials available, they'll take on a more of a local character. Right now, a building in the desert of Saudi Arabia generally tends to be exactly like a building being built in the coldest city in, uh, uh, in Chicago. Uh, so that, again, erases any kind of differentiation. And I think we crave for this differentiation. I think that's why tourism is thriving, and it's thriving to the places which do not uh, give up their differentiation. And I think there's a hunger for it, and so we should try and deal with it. Very one, a wonderful lecture. Uh, I'll call you Professor Softy because that's uh, where I know you from um, years ago at Harvard. Um, I was fascinated by your reexamination of habitat and um, a question that comes to mind in, in looking at the, these cities, especially in Asia, and in, in the way um, they're becoming much more dense, the traditional uh, form of housing is, is uh, being rapidly lost. In your um, reexamination, how is the spaces that people actually occupy, the internal spaces, how is that being changed by the new, um, the effort to become more like um, these other uh, high density towers? It, it, it's a good question because in Habitat uh, in Montreal, we built the apartments as, you know, into boxes. And you, depending on how much you could afford and how big a family you had, one or two or three or four boxes. Um, what happened over 40 years is that people moved in, they stayed and stayed, families grew, they got up, they got another couple of boxes next to them, they asked for permission to borrow holes. Uh, while the structural engineer was alive, we checked it and let them. So you, you had both gentrification, but you also had people creating their own environments anew. And you wouldn't believe what they did inside those boxes. So, I mean, many magazines have already done features like to show you had this contemporary thing that looked like Space Age and another one that looked like Louis XIV just moved in. And, and all this like by people making their place. So, in the more recent iterations, my attitude is give them, give them the loft, give them raw space, Determine as little as possible, except to give them lots of perimeter, lots of light, lots of ways to look out, lots of opportunity to create outdoor space as well. And as much as possible, let people do their thing. Now, it's not always possible, because sometimes developers want to complete the project, do everything. And, but people like to make place in their own image. And at this point, rather than control them, I'd rather give them the opportunity to do so. Because I think that the architecture actually gets richer as all this happens within a, 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 an urban fabric. So it's kind of interesting evolution. Last one. Uh, thank you for your excellent lecture. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in, in hearing some of your thoughts perhaps about the longevity of, of architecture and how we perceive it. Um, you know, in the United States, I think, and other parts of the world, we say sometimes that we're building for 20 years, and it used to be perhaps a lot longer. And I remember as a young student being in Europe and looking at the shells of old buildings that had been rehabilitated so many times, and the texture of the walls that, that had evolved over time had its own story. How do you... Um, I guess what, I, what I'd like to see is that, that we start building for the 100 year or the, or the longer, but how do you instill that, that uh, desire in the public to, build, to put the effort into the shell? And maybe that's yeah. what you were kind of, kind of talking yeah, about. Yeah, I have, I have different takes on this question. Uh, one reminds me of a quote from Auguste Perret, the turn of a 19th century uh, uh, French architect. And he said, what, makes a great, what is a great building? It's one that makes a great ruin. And uh, fascinating sort of pro provocative statement, because when you think of buildings that make great ruins, it's because they've got, they've got that shell, that infrastructure that sort of almost defies destruction. And then they get adapted and adapted. Uh, 
at the same time, I think we do build buildings. Certainly when I built my, my, the two airports I've done, I didn't have any confidence that they're going to sort of be there forever. Uh, because airports change, because technology changes, because transportation changes. And you know that you're doing something that's going to get abused and changed. So you try and give it the framework that it has. But when you think about urban places, I certainly think that when you, you think about, for example, this great space in, in Singapore, the, this, what I call the Cardo, the Grand Arcade, you could conceive of the structure, the bones that stay there for 100, 150 years, and everything that happens within that changes over time, changes even every decade. And that architecture should have those components which have long lives and those which don't. And then there are other buildings that you do which are national places, and you know that they probably will live longer, like a national museum or a memorial that probably has a long life. And the, and the real ultimate test there is when you think that in that way, you've got to think of design as being timeless, as lasting. And to me, the ultimate test, I talked about <coughs> fitness and beauty, but another way to express it, coming from another direction, is is it timeless? Will it get dated? You know, one of the things I really enjoy about Habitat, if I could sort of reflect on it, is I go there now to visit, and I, my first reaction is, how did he get away with it? And my second reaction is, it's pretty fresh. It's pretty fresh conceptually. You know, in 40 years, I don't feel it's dated. And I think that designs that have that capacity to feel timeless uh, have sort of transcended the fashion of the moment and therefore probably have a greater sense of fitness. So thank you very much.